If you asked someone to name one of the primary differences between this current generation of consoles and the next, chances are good that they would say the SSD. Well, while the SSD does offer a massive performance leap over a mechanical drive which was present in the previous generation, there are a number of questions I see routinely asked by people. Why does the PlayStation 5 SSD have 825 gigabytes? Why does an SSD even matter for games? I mean, sure, faster CPU, you can understand that. Faster GPU, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But why an SSD when it is so much of the next generation console budget, why not just throw all of that cash into either more RAM or a faster CPU or combination thereof? Well, my name's Paul and in this red gamingtech.com video, we're going to be answering all of those questions and more. This is the first of a small series which will be delving into the SSD of the next generation consoles. This one will be aimed to just get everyone up to speed um, and just so that they understand the basic principles of the console's SSD. In a future video, we'll be pitting the Xbox and PlayStation against one another and doing a more comparison style video. But in this one, I want to just focus on why an SSD is uh, chosen by Sony and Microsoft. And also, what exactly is the benefits of an SSD? And more to the point, one of the questions that I consistently get is why 825 gigabytes for the PlayStation 5's SSD? So hopefully you will have that answered. So first things first then, why an SSD? Why not just a standard mechanical drive? Well, back in the day, I heard a phrase when I was still learning about computing, which really stuck with me. The convoy will sail as fast as the slowest ship. In other words, whatever component is the slowest, whatever is the bottleneck, that is, of course, going to be the thing which limits performance. But to say mechanical drives are holding back performance is a bit like me asking an athlete to run a mile while also having no shoes, running on Lego, and occasionally I poke them in the eye with a sharp stick. In other words, it's not really conducive to them sprinting down and producing their best record time. If you weren't aware, current generation consoles use a mechanical drive, a hard drive. This literally is a spinning disc which turns at fast speeds such as 5400 RPM. A mechanical head then reads the data which is being held on this spinning magnetic disc. If you've ever used a vinyl record player, essentially it's similar in principle. Different tracks hold various songs and of course you can adjust the needle to the appropriate position. This is a tried and true method of holding data. Mechanical drives have been with us for a very long time and have gotten larger and larger. Back in the 90s, a hard drive wasn't even half a gig in size. And to accommodate this, caches have also increased in size in an effort to improve performance. The PlayStation 4 and Xbox One drives have served them well, theoretically, but as you probably guessed by now, there are lots of limitations. The first is that it takes time to find data on a disk. Keeping things simple here, there's basically a record where all of the data on the drive is kept. I mean, otherwise, the system didn't know where, say, a stored level for a game was. It would need to scan the entire drive to figure out where that level was, or even a smaller object. Long story short, though, it still takes time for the mechanical head to find the data on the disk. And this is bad enough for larger files, but if you have tons of smaller files all scattered over that hard drive, well, good luck. Secondly, there's an issue of how much data you can actually transfer. This is known as the read or write speed, depending on what you're doing. Here, things get, well, complicated. Different files end up having different transfer speeds depending on their size. For example, if you have tons of small files, let's say JPEGs, it can take a long time to read or write that data compared to a big mp4 of equivalent size or a big zip file which contains all of the jpegs so why is it then when you plonk an ffd inside your playstation 4 or hook one up via usb to the xbox don't you get this huge improvement in performance loading times are faster on an ssd sure for example, Final Fantasy VII definitely benefits with an SSD, but it's definitely not the so-called game-changer, and yes, it's a horribly cliché term, 
So lots of stuff is in the way. For one, games are simply not coded to take advantage of the SSD in current generations, i.e. you still have the sections where Lara Croft is trying to squeeze through a tight space, but, well, yes, occasionally that is for gameplay reasons, but also it helps mask loading, and we'll get more into how that works in just a moment. But furthermore, the CPUs in the current generation consoles are... I'm just going to use a pleasant way of describing them weedy. And yes, that is me being generous to the Jaguar CPUs inside both the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox. They were the best solutions that AMD had at the time and were probably the best option for both Sony and Microsoft, especially as they wanted to go the x86 route. But the CPUs are designed to be low power and designed to not put out tons of heat and Ultimately, uh, generally speaking, Jaguar is comprised of just four processor cores, but Microsoft and Sony doubled it to eight for their respective systems. But even so, the CPUs do not offer a ton of performance. Compare, for example, how Jaguar processors of the PlayStation 4 Pro here compare against a Ryzen 7 3700X. You'll notice that even with SMT disabled and the same clock frequency, Ryzen stomps it. It's based on the Zen 2 architecture, which of course forms the basis of the next-gen consoles. I'd also like to thank our Patreons for contributing so that we could pick up the 3700X and we can do tests like this. But not only is the CPU kind of weedy, it also has to do so many more tasks. For one, it needs to deal with little things like, oh, I don't know, issuing commands to the GPU. But furthermore, it also has all of the audio overhead to deal with, and currently, because there are no exactly decompression blocks uh, on the current generation consoles, which do the same job as the PlayStation 5, for example, or the Xbox, all of the decompression is being handled by the CPU. And therefore, you're in kind of this rock and a hard play situation. The more you compress the data, the faster it can load, in theory, but the more strain you're putting on the CPU. And given the CPU is doing so much other stuff, unless, of course, it's a loading screen, well, you can start to see how there's a rock and a hard place situation by games developers. The more they compress, the faster loading is, but they also have way less CPU performance to deal with stuff anyway, and they still, even if they used a large portion of the CPU um, for decompression, for example, from a loading screen, it's still not really fast enough and the mechanical drive is still not fast enough anyway. Okay, so what's different about the next generation consoles and why does the PlayStation 5 only have 825 gigabytes of space? Well, the PlayStation 5 uses a rather different design compared to what you would associate with the majority of customer-facing SSDs. There's a custom flash controller and also a 12-channel interface for the NAND flash memory. This, of course, makes up the SSD. Generally speaking, four-channel SSDs are what you'd expect for a cheaper-end drive in the Spectrum. Although, you can certainly get ones with more channels, such as eight. Higher capacity drives can go even higher still. As you can see from this official Sony illustration, there's quite literally 12 blocks connecting the 12-channel interface. Each block representing 64 GIB, not GB, space. To be clear, the 64 GIB is multiplied by 12, because there are 12 of these blocks, and then this brings us up to the 768 GIB of space, or 825 GB of real space, 825 GB. To be ultra, super, duper clear, this is raw space. Things such as the OS will, of course, be on the drive and will om nom nom the space, plus any other space which is reserved. I don't know the figures for sure, but if I had to guess, there's probably high 700 gigabytes which will be available for users. But don't worry, this is not doom and gloom, and we'll go into why in just a few minutes. Right, so those 12 channels run up to a custom flash controller and it can handle 5.5 gigabytes per second of uncompressed data. More on this in just a moment. You'll notice there's also four PCIe 4 lanes, 
which connect to the controller up to the main APU. So in short, 12 NAND chips connect to a custom flash controller, which in turn is connected via four PCIe lanes to the main console SOC. This obviously feeds data to the system based on priority level requests. So the SSD here has six priority levels of data access. And this is a major tweak Sony have made to the PlayStation 5's SSD. So let's say data which is being processed right now is meh, I can wait on that for a second. Well, let's say instead the system has this request which needs to jump the queue. Well, the PlayStation 5 can do this. It's a very lengthy topic and I won't delve too much into it here, but this is one of the reasons the PlayStation 5 needs a much faster drive than the 5.5 gigabytes per second. So because they don't have this priority system, regular SSDs only have a two level priority system, they need to make up for it by being faster to achieve this similar speed for the PS5. So then, back to the 5.5 gigabytes per second, that's uncompressed. If you're into development, there's a possibility you've heard of Zlib, Zlib, whatever you prefer, I prefer Z, which is a compressed file format. According to Cerny though, while the PlayStation 5 can support this, Kraken is preferred because it offers about a 10% better compression ratio. In summary then, the 5.5 gigabytes per second is more like eight or nine gigabytes per second in reality. It can be faster, around 20, if the data that the PS5 is working on happens to be really good at compression. So why is all of this important? Why does the SSD mean that we won't necessarily see massively ballooning size of games? Well, for one reason, it means that data doesn't need to be repeated multiple times on the disk. We all know those games where you see the same enemy in different levels, the standard grunt or soldier, or say you're in a city level and you see a red fire hydrant, but then you go to a different part of the city, you still see the red fire hydrant, and so on and so on. In a traditional mechanical drive, they will need to repeat that fire hydrant multiple times throughout the disc. Wherever a level loads or a section of a level loads which has that fire hydrant, there's a good chance that they will include it into the level data. And this is because it needs to reduce load times. But with an SSD, this is not needed. It would only need to keep one copy of it, theoretically. Further to this, the PS5 compresses data really well. And because it has the custom decompressor, which puts out around nine Zen 2 cores worth of performance. That is if the Zen 2 cores are clocked at the same PS5's 3.5 gigabytes. This means that more data can be compressed than the PlayStation 4. But getting back to what I was saying, the PS5 offloads the decompression of data like the Xbox can too on specific custom hardware. This means that not only do you need less of the data because you don't need a million fire hydrants, but you can also compress the data way more. So yes, there'll be more 4K textures, but I suspect games won't grow hugely in size. Indeed, they may even shrink. And this is not even taking into account technology like BC Pack for Xbox. And recently, of course, we've seen the announcement uh, for the PlayStation 5, where Sony have requested a license for all developers for the PlayStation 4 or the PlayStation 5, which can halve um, GPU texture data for developers, although I will stress that is up to half. And it also works very well with the custom hardware inside the PlayStation 5 too. So anyway, further evidence of this can even be found in Unreal Engine 5 and Nanite, where developers only need to offer for the highest quality model rather than tons of different lots for the same model. The system can on the fly adjust the model quality and therefore you don't need to store all of those lower quality assets with varying levels of geometry. I've done a deeper breakdown of this for UE5 if you want to check it out. I'll link it in the video description. Microsoft's data transfer speeds are slower than Sony's system. 
Compressed data rates are stated to be about 4.8 gigabytes per second on average. Definitely not exactly sluggish. Though, if you've been a subscriber for a few weeks, you'll probably have seen my story where one of the engineers working on the Xbox Series X has said that the public figures of 4.8 gigabytes per second for the Xbox's SSD are conservative. Quite frequently, at least according to this engineer, the Series X can hit figures of about 6 gigabytes per second with compressed data, but of course, they want to be more conservative and they don't believe it's going to be consistently hitting those speeds. And I respect them for being honest. The Xbox, though, does use the Velocity architecture, which of course does have custom decompression blocks. Apparently there's five Zen 2 cores worth of equivalent performance, though Microsoft's CPU does run a bit faster than PlayStation's, to be fair. There's also a direct storage API, and it's kind of an extension direct to direct X12 too, and naturally it will be part of PC development in the future. I don't really want to turn this into a lengthy comparison between the two systems, because this video is already getting kind of lengthy. But I will go into this further in a future video to compare the two. But one thing I do want to touch on is Microsoft's solution uses cartridge-like enclosures for its SSD. And their solution is probably easier for customers, because they seem to be planning to sell these like any peripheral, like a controller or, say, a headset. Sony, meanwhile, aren't so clear yet in their plans. They will have drives which work with the PlayStation 5, apparently, but those drives need to meet several criteria. The first is speed, but they also need the appropriate form factor, i.e. you can't have huge heat sinks attached. Sony apparently will be validating these drives, and we've already seen that um, the Samsung 980 Evo is going to launch in just a few months' time, and it may be a good candidate. Microsoft's approach is more conservative, but it's also easier for the user, especially if someone opts to have a massive back catalogue of games and they don't want to keep deleting them, particularly for folks who do have slower internet. For example, you could have two or three SSDs and you could just flick between them as you wanted. Faster access to data is what's been achieved. It really and truly is only a byproduct of what the teens goals were. That is to allow developers to have access to massive quantities of data and craft worlds which are more open and narratively rich, reducing the limitations which we see in the current generation. Naturally, the faster access of the SSD does leave constraints still. Ultimately, factors such as raw CPU performance, for example, come into play when running a game's logic. Picking on the console's RAM for a moment, Microsoft and Sony have both opted to use 16GB of GDDR6 for their respective systems. Ignoring bandwidth and just focusing on quantity, well, 16GB isn't that much of an upgrade compared to the previous generation. Take the Xbox One X, for example. It had 12GB of memory. So, on the surface, one could say the Microsoft Surface, if you will, no, you won't? Okay, well, I found it funny. That's only a small upgrade in memory. The difference is, though, that the RAM is being used in a very different way, and developers won't need to worry about cramming large portions of the level into 16 gigabytes, and can instead focus on streaming data in as it's needed. Technologies such as Microsoft's sampler feedback, for example, can give the GPU the ability to know what's happening with a texture in the game. I've gone more into this in my DirectX 12 Ultimate video, but to summarise here, it's not easy, especially in DirectX, to give developers insight into what's actually being loaded for the texture. In other words, what part of the texture is being visible to the players and what part of that texture is being used? And even the game engine itself doesn't really know the answer to that question. So, Massive quantities of memory could be wasted here alone, whereas with this new technology, the system can simply ask for specific pieces of data that, of that texture, and it's very fine-grained too. You can load portions of a texture in just 128k blocks in size. Given the full size comparatively of a, full, of a 4k texture, you could see one example 
of why this could be important. Cerny has also provided further clarity for the PlayStation 5 in the now infamous Road to PS5 event. Cerny essentially stated that the SSD can be thought of as RAM. Microsoft said similar for the Xbox too. But even if you take the 9 gigabytes per second figure of the PlayStation 5's compressed data figures for its SSD, it's still 50 times slower than the GDDR6 memory in the console. So that's not quite fast enough, right? Well, that's not really how it works. Think of it this way, generally, memory is split into several types of data in a system. There's a space in the memory for streaming in data, i.e. data that's being pulled into memory as you're running around the level. And this brings me to the next wonderful buzzword, working sets. Working sets actually are another term which is actually labelled fairly well. It's basically the memory that's being used right now and contains stuff that's actually relevant to the specific space around you. Let's take a really, really complicated level scenario. In other words, three box rooms which are all connected to each other at extreme angles. Which, well, this is the best case scenario for this specific example. Because let's say that they're Resident Evil 2 st uh, style labs. Though, to be honest, there could be anything you want while you're imagining this scenario. But let's say that you're in room 1 and you need to get to room 3 because there's a key card or whatever. Okay, so as you're running and running through the rooms, well, in the current generation, you won't notice any major hitching or stutter, right? Well, that's because as you're moving from the first room, the system is already grabbing or has already grabbed the data for the next room, probably even room 3. It's already resident in the RAM. So this means that when you enter the third room, you don't have bland geometry and 10 seconds later the texture loads and lighting finally is available to see and, and marvel over. Obviously though, this means that all of this data has been in memory. And this brings us up to Sony's image. The 8 gigabytes of memory for the PS4 contains data for about the next 30 seconds of gameplay. This is a rough figure. Possibly for, say, a game like Resident Evil 2. Yes, possibly I want to play Resident Evil 2 again if you couldn't tell. A fighting game would handle things differently because, well, it would just load things which are relevant for that specific fight. And other games, such as, say, an indie platformer, they would load probably everything into RAM as they may only be 2 or 3 gigabytes total for the entire title. The next generation, though, won't need to do this, again, depending on the title, but it can instead hold data for the next second or two of gameplay in its working set. Indeed, play a game and see how long it takes for your character to do a 180 in an FPS game. Even though it's a short period of time, less than a second, it still could mean that potentially a couple of gigabytes of data could be thrown into the console's RAM. And if we look at, say, Ratchet and Clank 2, it's a really nice example, which was, of course, shown on PlayStation to the then. Now, if you run frame rate tests or just go through the gameplay frame by frame, you can see that there are frame drops. I will just put an asterisk here and say that this is early software, so this may be fixed by the time the game comes out. But think of it this way. Each of those portals is basically its own level, its own entire unique little ecosystem, which means new textures, new enemies, new everything are going to be in that specific area. So basically, the amount of data which is being pulled in is just a few, maybe even less than a second, I was about to say a few seconds, but probably even less than that, is quite startling. Because it's not like the system can even cache a lot of that data, because if you have, say, a couple of different portals, well, you could go through portal A, you could go through portal B, but you could also just choose to go through none of those portals, and you could just continue to proceed through the level. So this is an example of how streaming data is going to be so important. Furthermore, going back to the Spider-Man demo for the PS4, there was a limit on how fast Spider-Man could traverse around the world. This was not a limitation because they didn't think that players could deal with the game running faster. 
Indeed, it's just a limitation that the that the actual uh, drive itself could not provide enough data to the system. I think that's a pretty good place to call the technical side of the video, although there is just a couple of other things I would like to discuss before we wrap up. One is PC gaming. And I believe that there's a few things which are going to happen on the PC platform. I've gone into this more extensively in another video, so I'll link it, of course, in the description of this one. Long story short, I think one of the most likely scenarios is that PCs will quickly adopt uh, NVMe SSDs, not SATA SSDs. SATA just does not offer the performance uh, which is going to be needed because SATA tops out a SATA free connection around 500-ish megabytes per second, which is, well, not ideal. Oh, and there is one other last important point. You can use the SSD in the console for backwards compatible games. For example, you could install FF7 on the PS5 or Gears on the Xbox, no problem. But you could be wasting that space with code which doesn't really benefit too much for it. So you're better to just plonk, technical term, a USB drive into the system. If you really want to, you could even opt to use an SSD uh, based USB. So, for example, you would use a USB to set a converter for an enclosure, and then, well, you could go ahead that way. It's still way slower than the SSD inside those consoles, of course. After all, SATA 3 hits about 500 megabytes per second, but the benefit is that SATA SSDs are quite cheap. But really, a decent external mechanical drive is probably the best option with, of course, its enclosure. I suspect, though of course I haven't tested this yet, the game will still load faster than it would for the original hardware. Another likely scenario is that games themselves will need way more RAM. Currently, you can generally get away with 8 gigabytes, especially if you're willing to compromise quality settings. Obviously, that does depend. Uh, indie titles will need less. AAA games will probably need more. But this is probably going to double to a recommended minimum of 16 gigabytes, but honestly, you'd be better off with 32, I imagine. And once again, a fast NVMe drive, especially if you want to take advantage of high quality settings for textures. Uh, Unreal Engine, um, the Unreal Engine demo for the PlayStation 5 is a great example of this. To achieve anything like that on the PC, you're going to need A, a fast NVMe drive, be lots of RAM, and then I suspect that the PC can kind of brute force things. It has way more RAM, it can throw things in uh, to memory a lot more efficiently, so it doesn't need to worry about pulling data so quickly off of the SSD. As I said, I've gone into this way more extensively and more technically in another video, which I'll link in the description. But I think this is a good place to call the video. Yes, there is a lot more stuff, and I will be doing a deeper comparison between the consoles, as I said earlier, but I want to just get everyone onto the same page. So if you've enjoyed the video, well, of course, give it a like and comment down below what if you found the video helpful. And of course, share it with your friends or on social media as it gives us a massive boost on the channel. And uh, yeah, with any luck, I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.